praise the Lord. Good morning, my dear friends. Welcome to Daybreak. Every morning is a gift of God. Let's thank and praise the Lord with this choir. I'm sure the hymn has drawn you closer to God. Now sharpen your ears to listen to today's message. In a certain place, a bus driver had achieved a unique record. In his 23 years of service, he had driven more than one and a half lakh kilometers without having a single accident. When asked how he was able to do this unique record, the bus driver had just one simple advice, always be focused on the road. As Christians, all of us could take the simple advice of the bus driver and apply it in our own Christian lives. Always be focused on the road. The Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 22, verse 36, Jesus says, Be vigilant at all times and pray that you have the strength to escape 
the tribulations that are imminent and to stand before the Son of Man. Jesus invites and exhorts all of us to remain vigilant and watchful at every moment of our life. To build a character, it takes years, but to lose, it takes only a moment. Christian life, therefore, is a great challenge to always remain vigilant, watchful, and faithful. Surely, in life, we have many distractions. As we make the journey of life, it is possible that the vehicle of our life can meet with a lot of blockages, a lot of barriers, and there can be moments and tendencies to have accidents. But as drivers of our life, if we are focused always on the road map that Jesus Christ has shown us, then we can be free from accidents. Jesus always supplements all of us with immense graces and blessings so that when we cooperate with his will, he helps us to always be safe in life. Jesus wants all of us to prepare our lives for his second coming, to prepare with enthusiasm, to prepare with vigilance, and to prepare with care. Let's therefore look into our lives, examine and check. Are there certain things that are taking me away from living a faithful Christian life? Maybe they are certain sinful tendencies. Maybe they are certain attachments to which I'm not able to let go. This day, let us have the courage to let go of anything that can take me away from Christ and his love. And being watchful, vigilant, and careful, let us always have our eyes focused on the road and thus lead an honest as well as a faithful Christian life. May the good Lord always bless all of us with this grace to be focused in life and watchful on the road to live a Christian life without any accidents. May the name of the Lord be ever praised. Live Jesus. Let's draw these lessons from the message and put them into practice. Saints are modeled for us. So let us have a glimpse of the saint of the day. Today, we celebrate the feast day of Saint Frumentius of Ethiopia, also known as Ebuna, or the father of Ethiopia. Together with his twin brother, Saint Adesius, he is credited with bringing the faith to that region of Africa, as well as translating the New Testament into the local language to make it more accessible to the people there. A disciple of Saint Athanasius of Alexandria, Saint Frumentius turned the tragedy of his youth into a powerful opportunity to preach the truth of the gospel to those in need of it. His life story reminds us that of Joseph from Old Testament. Born in Tyre, Lebanon, Frumentius and his brother were taken on a voyage to Ethiopia while still young by their uncle Meropius, a Christian philosopher and explorer. During the voyage, tragedy struck and the ship was attacked by barbarian pirates while harbored in a community on the Red Sea. The entire crew, with the exception of two children, were murdered and the ship destroyed. Frumentius and Adesius were taken as slaves. The two youth were unlike the people of the region in appearance and as such were given to the king of Aksum as a curiosity. He was immediately taken with their youth, beauty and wit and installed them as members of his court, seeing to their education and providing them protection and care. Edicius would eventually become the king's cupbearer and Frumentius his secretary. The brothers grew in faith, serving their king well. On his deathbed, 
Grateful for years of service, the king granted the twins their freedom. However, the queen begged them to stay at court and assist her in governing the country until their heir to the throne came of age. This they gladly did, convincing her to allow the introduction of Christianity to the country and opening trade ties with the West. Over time, the brothers used their influence to spread Christianity first throughout the court and then throughout the country. They encouraged Christian merchants who had been recently allowed into the country to practice their faith openly by meeting at places of public worship. Eventually, this led to the conversion of the native residents. When the prince reached the age of governing, the brothers resigned their posts. Saint Frumentius travelled to Alexandria where he arranged a meeting with Saint Athanasius and begged him to send a bishop back to Ethiopia to shepherd the hatching Christian community. Athanasius, a wise man of faith, consecrated Frumentius a bishop, sending him back to the Ethiopians, recognizing him to be the best man for the position. Upon his return, Frumentius was welcomed back with reverence and through working of miracles and holy example, converted the king and subsequently the majority of the nation. He worked tirelessly throughout the country until his death in approximately the year 383. The people in Ethiopia called him Abuna, our father, Kasata Birhan, revealer of light, and Abba Salama, father of peace. Following the example of Frumentius life, we can bloom where we are planted. He was just a young boy in a strange and pagan land, but he made the best of the situation and brought truth and life to that deserted land and lost people. Like Saint Frumentius, we may bring the light of Christ with us wherever we go, in the hope of inspiring others to follow him. After having listened to the saint, let us resolve to lead a saintly life. Word of God is the food for our soul. So let us prepare our hearts for today's daily bread. Today, once again, we read the anointing at Bethany as reported in Mark chapter 14, verses 3 to 9. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another, in anger, why was this ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii, and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. This is the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Dear friends, we had been reflecting for the last two days on this anointment, the anointing of Jesus at Bethany. And we have seen the person who anointed Jesus is the the sister of Lazarus called Mary of Bethany. And this take, took place in Bethany in the house of Lazarus. And this woman surrendered, gave herself totally to Jesus as an uh, act of devotion. And Jesus accepted this. Now, the, the questioning of the disciples or the bystanders um, was confronted by Jesus. And we focus today on this reply of Jesus. First of all, Jesus is defending the woman. Let her alone. Why do you blame her? So she has done a good thing, Jesus said. 
So there is a kind of hypocrisy Jesus unmasks in this event. The persons who were calculating the value of the perfume poured on the head of Jesus were not in, so much in, in a love of the poor, but as a kind of criticism, not knowing why this woman has done it. And Jesus says, you can help the poor whenever you want. It's always there. It's not a command or it's not a statement that there will be always poor, but that's a, that's a fact. And there's also in the, uh, the um, Deuteronomy, there will be poor, victims of exploitation, whatever. And you can help them whenever you want. So now Jesus is pointing to the particular event. Why did she do that? Maybe or may not be. She did not know what she was doing, but she was doing an act of reverence and devotion. But Jesus takes this as symbolic action, a symbolic anointing. She has anointed my body for its burial. Nobody knew that. And she did not know that either. It would, Mark would later say that they had no time to anoint the body of Jesus before burying it because too late. He was brutally killed and the body was taken down before the dusk and it's already Sabbath was beginning and they had no time to buy ointment or anoint the body. They had to bury him in a haste. So Jesus is telling she has done it in advance. So this person was doing a great service to me, anointing my body for its burial. So this is already pointing to the death of Jesus. So when the woman was anointing in a symbolic way, in a sacramental way, the body of Jesus, the disciples considered it as a waste. There's one more thing we have to keep in mind. When you come to the Gospel of John, it is much more, much more clear. The anointing took place the day before Jesus entered Jerusalem in the triumphant entry, six days before the Passover. So the woman anointed Jesus the, the night before his entry into Jerusalem as the king. So John is implying thereby this anointing is a royal anointing. Jesus is anointed as the king. The Messiah is the one who is anointed. The Messiah is the Christos, is the one who is anointed. And the anointing of Jesus is the, done by a woman not by a high priest, not by a priest or a prophet. And John would say this anointing is an, an, the royal anointing. Jesus is being anointed as the king. And the next day he enters the Jerusalem as the king. And finally, this anointing leads him to the cross, that is the throne. So it's always a kind of um, reversal of normal situations. The one who anointed is not a priest, but a woman. And in John, the anointing takes place on the feet, not on the head. And Jesus is anointed to be the king and his kingdom and his throne is the cross. Anointed by a woman and dying on the cross, Jesus manifests his kingship. A totally different revelation. And this is also implied here. So when we are looking for a glorious king, a king like David, we are mistaken. God reveals himself in a totally changing, toppling our, put, putting aside, so confusing our thinking, our plan patterns. The one who died on the cross is the one who is enthroned. The one who is anointed by the woman is the king. And this anointing is a preparation for his death and burial through which he manifests his royalty. So Jesus says, don't disturb her. And this will be proclaimed wherever the gospel is proclaimed. So the woman is giving us an example of total self-giving surrender, not for the luxury of any kind, but the total surrender to God and total giving into God's service. Let's conclude with a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this great revelation of the anointing of Jesus at Bethany as a preparation for his death and burial through which he manifested his kingship. Enable us to understand, to grasp this paradox, which still remains enigmatic to us, difficult to understand. Open our minds 
Send us your spirit to teach us the truth that you are revealing through Jesus Christ. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm sure today's daily bread has given you a new insight to the scriptures that you have listened. As we come to the end of this episode, let us once again thank and praise our God with this hymn. My dear friends, I really hope the last half an hour has certainly been a blessing to you. Until we meet, stay blessed.